Hello and welcome to this Aperio webinar. I'm Ian Dolphin from the Aperio Foundation and I'll be moderating the event. Aperio is an association of higher education institutions and commercial partners around the world that collaboratively produce open source software serving education and research. Today's topic is learning what works when scaling analytics infrastructure. And I'm pleased to introduce Lou Harrison, Director of Educational Technology Services at Delta at North Carolina State University, and Gary Gilbert, who's a software architect with Unicom. There'll be time for Q&A via microphone or chat at the end of the presentation, but if you'd like to post questions into the chat as they occur to you, we'll capture them and repeat them when we reach that point. Please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and posted to the Aperio YouTube channel. <clears throat> With that, thanks again for attending, and over to Linda Fang of Unicon, who will provide a short overview of the session. Thanks, Ian. So yes, uh, this is Linda Fang, and I'm a software architect with Unicon. Um, and for those of you who might not be familiar with Unicon, we're a consulting company. Uh, we focus on education technology, um, and we're a commercial affiliate of the Perio Foundation. Um, we've been involved in the Perio Learning Analytics Initiative uh, since 2015, um, and we provide services for open analytics technologies like the Open LRW, the Open Dashboard, and Student Success Plan. Today, we're going to share our experiences in scaling up the analytics infrastructure from an original pilot to the enterprise level, um, together with uh, Lou um, from NC State. Uh, and Lou is actually going to be covering the background and the key drivers and the results for uh, the work. And uh, Gary's going to then cover infrastructure and components used in the implementation and then talk about some of the considerations uh, when thinking about scale. Uh, Lou is actually going to come back at the end and then talk about uh, some of our next steps uh, as we move forward with this project. Um, and as Ian mentioned, we would love to have your questions um, throughout the presentation, um, and uh, we'll be collecting them, um, and then we'll have uh, a Q&A session uh, towards the end, so Lou and Gary can go over that towards the end. Um, so over to you, Lou. Uh, great, Linda. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is going to be pretty exciting. I'm going to, as Linda said, I'm going to, I'm going to do some, some his history stuff, but I'm going to try and go through it pretty fast uh, because Gary's got some, some pretty interesting infrastructure slides, uh, and I want to leave plenty of time for him. And of course, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. I, uh, I love doing these things, and I especially love the Q and A session at the end. I think that's, uh, that's where some of the most interesting stuff happens. So, so with that. Having said that, let me just say that uh, this project started as the Open Academic Analytics Initiative several years ago. Um, you can see it was it was it was funded by Educause and, and Bill and Melinda Gates, and the idea was to make uh, an early warning alert system based on uh, bio demo data from a student information system and LMS data uh, to predict in advance students were going to have some sort of problem and hopefully intervene. Um, it, it evolved over time and the name change is now the Learning Analytics Processor LAP project. Still, uh, still same basic idea, but it just has a different name and it's now part of Aperio. Um, and again, we got involved with Marist, who has the original researchers and Unicon. Um, Pretty early on, I think in the second year that uh, that, that stuff was happening with this. So uh, I, I will say uh, I am not a data scientist, nor nor <laughs> nor do I play one on TV. Uh, but if anyone is interested in how all of that works, this next slide has a uh, a link to uh, to the paper that uh, that sort of started it all. Okay, so by all means, uh, if you are a data scientist read the paper. Um, so so uh, a few years back, we had a phase one proof of concept. It was small. We only sent a, a limited amount of data off site. And more importantly, um, the model that was used was trained at 
Marist. It wasn't trained at NC State. Uh, so it wasn't a particularly great model for NC State. NC State is a very different school than Marist. Marist is a small liberal arts college that's pretty pricey to get into. Um, NC State is a big land grant school, so we're, we're fairly different. But having said that, we did send them data on some courses and and they ran it through their model and it turned out that uh, the proof of concept, things were pretty good. Recall rates were in the 80 to 90% range. There were more false positives than, than one would like. Um, and initially we were pretty concerned about that. But I will say, uh, given all of the things being equal, I would rather have false positives that, and, and, and decent recall because, you know, if you intervene for someone who doesn't need it as much, I mean, that's a much better situation than missing somebody that does need the intervention, right? So the next year, uh, we started building it in-house, right? So, so we worked again with Unicon and Marist to run the LAP locally uh, with data and the idea being, if we're going to do this, I would like to be able to do it for all of our courses and, 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 and do it in such a way that we can, we can actually, you know, help people that, that, that need to have, need to have help. So, so, so the second year we spent on doing that, um, uh, and, and, and started thinking about making it bigger. Now, now last year, uh, we had a relatively good install base of the software and that, that we're using and it's big data software. Uh, it's not as automatic as we would like, but we could do some runs with our data and do some, some, some testing and some, uh, uh, you know, some interesting things. Uh, one of the things that I, that I find very interesting about the way this uh, predictive analytics works is that when you first start playing with it, you generate a lot of questions, more questions than you do answers. Like why, yeah, you know, why, why is this thing such a big predictor? Why is this thing not a terribly big predictor, and so on, so forth. One of the things that was disturbing to us was that if we tried to do one big model with all the courses at NC State, you know, forty thousand students worth or so, it turned out the LMS usage did not play a huge factor in the model, in the prediction, and we were worried about that, right? Uh, because we feel like usage of the LMS should be important. So, so what we did, and this was last fiscal year, we spent a fair amount of time slicing and dicing the, the data into different segments of population so that we could do a run, you know, with this subgroup of people, we could do a run with that subgroup of people. So, so some of them were, you know, by student level, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, graduate. Uh, enrollment size, small courses, medium courses, large courses. The most interesting one, in my opinion, was by LMS usage. So we took the um, the log data from the LMS and we just came up with some relatively arbitrary breakpoints and said, if you have no log data, then um, you don't use the LMS. If you have uh, this much log data, you're, you're a light user. If you have this much, you're a medium user. If you have this much, you're a heavy user. And we subdivided that way. And it turns out that there were some pretty exciting uh, differences in running those models, that, which I'll show you in, in, in just a second. Uh, but um, I think diving a little bit deeper, note that, that if you look at the population of courses on campus, you know, the 3,000 or so sections that are taught in any given semester, um, so, some not huge, but Size, reasonably sized portion doesn't use the LMS at all. A whole bunch of people use it very, very shallowly. Uh, a small bunch, again, uses it at sort of a, a medium depth level. And then there's a tiny little fraction that use it heavily, go into the tools and do deep dives and use all of the capabilities. Uh, and it turns out uh, that when you average those few courses with the whole bunch that, that, that sort of use it a little bit, everything everything sort of turns into a uniform shade of gray. So so I put this slide here. I'm not I'm not going to go over all of these numbers. There's there's definitely a lot of stuff to to look at here. But uh, but the, the thing that, that that I think is interesting is right right there. The thing I've circled on the screen is the recall. 
And I wish that the columns were in a better order because it would, uh, it, it would, it would show my point a little bit better. But imagine, if you will, the, the the light gray was over on between the black and the red. So the black column is just one model, the average of averages, if you will, right? And if you look at the rest of them, it's what we broke them up into cohorts of no LMS usage, low, medium, and high, right? In that order, uh, light gray. Red, light red, dark gray, dark red. And you can see that slope is that, wow, look, look, at, look at how much better a prediction we get with um, the high LMS usage courses. And it turn, turns out also that the LMS uh, predictors uh, factored in a lot more, which makes sense. Uh, it's good that it makes sense intuitively. Uh, but that that made us feel like you know the LMS is definitely uh, a benefit, and and that we can. Uh, my boss was very happy to to be able to say that the people who use the LMS more are helping us to make better predictions. So in in addition to that, which we worked on, there was a whole bunch of stuff uh, that we did again with uh, Unicon to. Uh, anticipate pulling data in from other sources to make it a little bit more uh, enterprisey, if you will. And that's basically the bulk of what Gary's going to talk about. But just just to give you like the overview from our perspective, uh, right now we're using the demo, the, de the bio demo data and Moodle logs. Uh, we want to be able to incorporate data and logs from other things. We have Blackboard Collaborate as a synchronous tool. We use MediaSite for lecture capture. They all collect them you know, uh, data on how they're being used, when they're being used, who's using them, stuff like that. We should be able to uh, do that. We want to put that all, all of our data in a place where we can get to it easily. We don't have to keep making custom integrations all the time to our model. So we're standing up a learning records warehouse, right? So the idea is we put all of the data and all of the logs in the learning records warehouse, and then the LRW and the model talk to each other through a defined channel that it doesn't have to change uh if, if that makes sense to everybody and, and 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 the other thing we've been working on for the past uh, uh several months or so is to implement open dashboard as a way to see activity in our tools and um we hope to be able to integrate the prediction value as well into the open dashboard so a faculty member could go into the dashboard for their class and look at the um the predictions on who's going to do well and who's going to do poorly and maybe help you know intervene uh before there's there's an issue and our goal i will say is to be able to you know run the predictive uh model pretty early in the course in the first two three four weeks so that if we see a person or people who need an intervention um you know they have time to, to actually pull it out so so with that, I'm going to hand over to Gary and let him do his thing. All right. Thanks, Lou. Sure, man. Uh, so over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, the infrastructure uh, that backs uh, all of these uh, all these features that, that Lou has mentioned. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about just uh, analytics infrastructure in general, what I mean by an open analytics infrastructure, and then we'll get into some of the specifics uh, around the implementation at North Carolina State. So quickly, um, you know, if you think about an analytics infrastructure, you know, what, what, what are you trying? What are you trying to accomplish? You know, you're trying to bring in uh, a wide variety of data uh, from a number of different sources. Uh, and, and store that somewhere. And then uh, you, you want to be able to utilize that data for things like analytics, predictive analytics, academic analytics, uh, for reporting purposes, uh, for uh, things like visualizations. So, I, I, and, I, and I think you know any uh, analytics infrastructure, um, those are two kind of obvious goals. The things that make something an open analytics infrastructure versus just a traditional analytics infrastructure is, number one, uh, utilizing open standards for interoperability. So, you know, leveraging things like 
the IMS caliper standard for event transport. Uh, and then, where possible, utilizing open software uh, like Aperio uh, Foundation components, open models, uh, and open processes. So th those are the things that really truly make an open analytics infrastructure. And so if we, if we think about that from a flow of data perspective, um, typically we have a set of event sources. Uh, generally speaking, the LMS is almost always one of them. Uh, then maybe you have some other internal systems and, and maybe even some third-party systems like publisher software that you're integrating with. Those systems feed data uh, into a centralized store. In, in, in most cases, when we're talking about an open analytics infrastructure, that store is going to be a learning record store uh, or a learning record warehouse. And then you have uh, downstream systems using that data from the learning record warehouse. Maybe they're using it for uh, analytics purposes or they're doing some ETL on it and sending it back into the warehouse and then it gets used by other downstream systems like dashboards or student success systems or even for reporting purposes. And so that's the general flow of data and I think we've seen that uh, manifest itself in all of the different analytics projects we've done. The software hasn't always been the same, the event sources haven't all, always been the same, but kind of the general flow of data has always looked something like this. And so if we look at it from uh, the North Carolina State implementation, uh, we're looking at something like this today. Uh, you know, obviously over time we're, this will evolve to include other data sources and other usage uh, systems. But for now, um, we have a couple of sources. Uh, we have Moodle, uh, which is which is the LMS uh, that is providing uh, the event data. Uh, so it's right, right now we're capturing it based on the the Moodle logs, but ultimately it'll be a live stream of events as they happen uh, being streamed into the LRW. And then there's also uh, a staging database, uh, which is one of our sources, and that's the source for all of the supporting information. So what we found in other projects is that while we need the event data, it's almost always not enough. We, we need additional context, we need user information, we need course section information, we need enrollment information to be able to do all of the visualizations, reports, and even predictive analytics that we want. So in, in the case of North Carolina State, uh, they have a staging database that pulls data from both Moodle and the SIS and puts it there for the uh, open LRW, uh, which is being used as the storage mechanism to pull in and capture. So once we have all of that data uh, in the LRW, uh, we have a couple of usages, you know, one, um, uh, they have a Hadoop infrastructure uh, that's being used to execute the predictive model. So data is, uh, will be coming into Hadoop from the LRW and then being pushed back uh, from Hadoop into the LRW. And then the dashboard that, that Lou mentioned is pulling all of its data for visualization purposes uh, from the LRW. And so if we look at that from a, a more of a deployment perspective, it looks something like this. We have a, a load balancer that, that sits in front uh, that's publicly accessible. And then internally, we have uh, two clusters, uh, one dashboard cluster, so multiple instances of the dashboard software running, multiple instances of the LRW running, and they both talk to a cluster of uh, Mongo database instances. So that's, that's a high level view of, of the infrastructure. And now I'll go into some of the specific components that make it up. Uh, so the first one, and probably the biggest one, uh, is, is OpenLRW. Uh, OpenLRW is part of the Aperio uh, Learning Analytics Initiative. Um, it, it's a piece of software that's evolved uh, pretty significantly over the last couple of years. You know, when we originally um, started looking at uh, an open source learning record store back when we first started. It was called Open LRS, Open uh, Learning Record Store. Um, you know, we built it just to capture the event data. Uh, but as I mentioned, it quickly became uh, pretty apparent that we needed other information uh, in addition to that event data. Uh, so, so we renamed it Warehouse, 
uh, and started to capture not only the event data, uh, but also all of that supporting information, uh, users, courses, enrollments, et cetera, uh, to, to have that complete picture of uh, all of the information that we'll need for things like visualizations and, and reports. Uh, so to do that and to, and to maintain um, kind of that notion of an open analytics infrastructure, we've chosen a set of uh, open standards uh, to implement within the LRW uh, to, to model all of that data. So uh, the LRW supports uh, the XAPI and IMS caliper standards uh, for event capture. And then it uses the IMS one roster standard to model all of that supporting information. Uh, and we've been pretty successful with this because you know, both the caliper and one roster uh, data models are pretty extensible. So when we found cases where you know, the, the spec didn't exactly meet our needs, we've been able to uh, use some of those extension mechanisms uh, to meet whatever data needs we had. Uh, a little bit about the software itself. So OpenLRW is a Java uh, Spring Boot application. Uh, I think you'll find that's true across all of the Aperio uh, LAI uh, components. Um, it, it uses you know, a lot of the new features from Java 8, uh, specifically MapReduce. So if you're, if you're interested in uh, some of those new features around the MapReduce uh, in Java 8, uh, check out that code. If we, we do some interesting stuff in there with that. Um, one of, I think the, one of the most valuable and interesting things about the LRW uh, is its, the way that it's packaged up. Uh, so it's packaged as an executable jar file with Tomcat embedded, which means you don't have to uh, stand up your own Tomcat instance to run it. You simply run it as a Java process, and, and that Tomcat instance uh, kind of comes with that for you. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, the LRW and, and the other uh, components uh, in the infrastructure leverage uh, MongoDB as a data store. So uh, because we're talking about scalability uh, this afternoon, I uh, just want to touch on a few things around performance and scalability. So uh, number one, from the beginning, uh, our intention was to make the LRW completely stateless. And, uh, and, and we've, we've been able to do that uh, you know, using a couple of mechanisms that I'll talk about a little later. But this allows us to be completely horizontally scalable. <coughs> Excuse me. Which means we can spin up or spin down uh, additional nodes uh, of the LRW as traffic grows or decreases. So simply add a node to the cluster, and you can start to accept uh, requests on it. There's no need for uh, sessions or anything like that. Um, for scalability purposes in terms of storage, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're leveraging MongoDB. And we, we haven't actually reached a point with any of our projects yet where we've had to uh, get into sharding. But we know that feature is there in MongoDB and likely something we'll have to use as we get into you know, really massive, you know, hundreds of millions of event data sets. So that's one of the main reasons we chose uh, MongoDB as, as the data store mechanism. Um, you know, it's obviously very widely uh, adopted. It's, it, it kind of plays nicely with, with Spring Boot, uh, but also because it has some of these features that will allow it to really scale out when needed. And then uh, one last uh, topic on, on OpenLRW in terms of scalability. Obviously, with this kind of data, security is very important. Uh, and you know, there's always the trade-off of, uh, of security and scalability and performance. But I think we've made some good choices around uh, the API security uh, by, by using uh, JWT uh, for the security mechanism, which allows it to be stateless but still have enough information to apply certain uh, permissions, authentication, and access rules. The other thing we did uh, from the start was to uh, break data down uh, by organization and, and tenant uh, from the beginning. So we, we, we looked at a lot of different options for, uh, for splitting that data, for, you know, for multi-tenancy support, uh, but ultimately uh, ended up on a, a kind of a key approach um, where every record in the system 
you know, has a, a tenant key and an organization key, which allows us to kind of slice up that data as we need to. So <clears throat> one thing that I always uh, am asked about um, is how we treat uh, Caliper and XAPI uh, in the LRW. Now, since we're supporting both standards, we had to make a decision as to how we stored that information. Um, <clears throat> and because this is, these are our largest data sources, uh, this was an important uh, decision to make uh, for scalability purposes. So, um, for, you know, for lack of a better uh, better term, we, we're kind of all in on Caliper uh, in OpenLRW. Um, we, we still support XAPI. Uh, however, there are a lot of good XAPI alternatives out there in terms of uh, learning record stores, uh, but less so with Caliper. So we, we've, we've made kind of a conscious decision uh, to make uh, Caliper um, kind of the preferred event uh, format for OpenLRW. And because of that, uh, when we take in uh, both formats, you know, we're taking in Caliper messages and we store them essentially as is. We do uh, decorate the messages with some additional data, so things like tenant and organization ID. But for the most part, we store Caliper message as is. That's not the case with XAPI. Uh, when we take XAPI in, uh, we, before we store it, we convert it to, cap, uh, to Caliper format. And, and we're doing this, uh, you know, based on a couple of, of different transformations that have been done by uh, one, the Korean Ministry of Education. That's the current transformation that's being used. And then we have a mechanism in place that, as we get additional transformations, whether it's from IMS or ADL or, or some other organization, uh, we'll be able to leverage those as well. So this was important for scalability purposes because we now just have a single collection that represents all event data. Uh, so when we make, we, we, when we query that data back out, uh, we don't have to make multiple calls uh, to different collections to get all of the data for a particular course or a particular organization. And then just briefly touching on the other entities that we support, you know, I mentioned uh, tenants organizations and the different types of events, but we also have support and, and meaning we can store and then we have APIs that expose this information, all of that one roster data. So things like users, classes, enrollments, uh, line items, which are representations for assignments. And then a, a very important um, uh, set of data, which are what I call the user and class mappings. And so we use these collections to map uh, IDs from different systems um, you know, whether it's an LTI launch or an SIS system or an internal LMS ID, uh, we use the user and class mapping collections to be able to have a central store to be able to look up the mappings for all, all of uh, a particular set of IDs. So, you know, maybe a user has multiple IDs across different systems. We use these collections to centralize all of that so that if we get one ID, we can map it back to the right person. Moving on to uh, open dashboard, um, o o like, like the uh, LRW, the dashboard has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, when we originally uh, started working on the dashboard, you know, our intention was to make it more of a framework uh, and, and allow people to can leverage the framework to make their own visualizations. Um, but the reality was uh, you know, we, we just didn't see progress in that. We, you know, there were there were a handful of visualizations that were created, um, but we didn't see the adoption uh, of of the framework uh, that we wanted. So over time, uh, the dashboard has really evolved into more of a uh, a faculty and staff uh, tool uh, for monitoring student activity. And so I'll show you a screenshot, I think, on the next slide uh, of what that looks like. Uh, but you know, that's. That's, um, that was a conscious decision, and I think you know, by leveraging the data that's in the LRW, we'll be able to build out you know, a good set of tools for faculty and staff, and then ultimately over time, you know, potentially open that up to students as well. So from a technical perspective, um, you know, very much the same as open LRW. So you know, the idea here is that if you're, if you're working 
uh, you know, developing open LRW and you want to use the dashboard, you know, you have the same set, you have the same set of, set of technologies, you have the same uh, patterns and conventions uh, across both systems so that you can kind of transition from a development perspective pretty easily. The, the other thing is, um, you know, like the, like the LRW, the dashboard is, is packaged up as a JAR executable, uh, meaning, you know, you can just roll it out, it'll have Tomcat packaged and, and spin it up as a Java process. So deployment, like the LRW, is, is pretty simple as well. And, and so here, here's a view of, uh, of just an example dashboard for a particular student, just in case you haven't seen the open dashboard before. Uh, this is uh, the, the heat map uh, type of uh, visualization that uh, Lou had mentioned earlier. Um, and we, we sh I show that uh, inside, in this particular case, uh, the Canvas LMS. Um, the dashboard from an instructor and faculty perspective is, is only accessible via LTI. Right? So um, the idea is that you would uh, create an LTI link uh, to the dashboard uh, in your LMS course, they would launch into it, and they would only see the data uh, for students in that particular course. So <clears throat> looking at uh, kind of a high-level technical view of, of the dashboard web application, there's really two pieces. And ultimately, we may actually split this into two separate deployable components. But for now, it's all packaged as one. Um, there's a, the client side, which is a set of Angular JS modules. So if you're familiar with Angular and JavaScript, you should be able to maneuver your way around uh, the front end pretty easily. And then on the back end, it follows pretty typical Java, um, you know, layer cake uh, type of pattern where we have a set of controllers that expose an API, a set of services that uh, process that data, and then a set of data providers that talk it to back-end systems, whether it's a database or a third-party system. <clears throat> In terms of scalability, the uh, absolute uh, critical thing uh, to be able to scale up an application like the dashboard, where it's going to be uh, you know, heavily viewed from the front end, was session storage. Uh, and so, you know, we knew that going into it, um, and so we made a decision uh, to store, instead of storing sessions in memory, whether it's in Tomcat or some other mechanism, we're storing sessions in the database, uh, and specifically in storing the session information in MongoDB. So this allows us to horizontally scale uh, the dashboard instances, so we can spin up or spin down, uh, like, the, like the LRW, spin up or spin down as many uh, instances as are needed or not needed uh, based on traffic. Uh, and, and because we have the session in the database, as long as the request comes back with the right session identifier, <laughs> it can hit any of these instances and, uh, and react accordingly. <coughs> So this is a preemptive slide because we, we typically get this question pretty often. Um, so as I mentioned, the dashboard is, is currently only intended for, for faculty and staff. Um, and, and if we wanted to allow student access, we'd have to do a couple of things. So number one, um, we'd have to take the APIs uh, that are currently exposed by the, by the dashboard um, and, and to some extent the LRW and apply a little bit of finer grained authorization to them, specifically you know, ensuring that uh, a student could only see uh, the student's own information. And then we'd have to then adapt the UI to that type of view as well. So that's the LRW, that's the dashboard. Um, I, I think the mechanism to get event data into the LRW and then ultimately dashboard is pretty well understood. You know, typically you have uh, some kind of plug-in uh, or, or code within your learning management system or supporting systems that are publishing that event data in real time, you know, sending it off in XAPI or Caliper format uh, to the learning record warehouse. But how do we get all of that uh, supporting data into the LRW? 
And, and to do that, um, we found that we've had to typically create these custom applications, and we refer to these applications as data loaders. Uh, and so this, this idea of a data loader was not something that we really thought about uh, when we first started building out these different analytics components. But if, if you think about it, and especially once you introduce something beyond event data, you know, th th there's obviously a need for a mechanism to get you know, that user, that course, that enrollment information uh, into the Learning Record Warehouse. And so we've, we've begun to build these data loaders uh, out against a number of different systems. And basically all they are is Java applications um, that you run uh, at some interval, right? Maybe it's daily, uh, maybe it's more often if you have uh, more frequent uh, events uh, ch or changes to the data in your learning management system or supporting system. Uh, but basically they just take, uh, take the data from those systems, whether it's an LMS or even a student information system, uh, look for the deltas, and then send that off to uh, the learning record warehouse to store. So and if we look at that from a uh, kind of flow perspective, and, and this example here is uh, looking at the Canvas data loader, but we also have one that we built for North Carolina State for, for Moodle data, uh, and we have uh, ones for other learning management systems and other, other uh, supporting systems as well. In this case, we're looking at Canvas data. <clears throat> so Canvas uh, provides their data uh, daily export onto the Amazon S3 uh, storage platform. So in our case, uh, this particular data loader, Canvas data loader, Java application, is run uh, typically daily. Uh, the process is it goes out, it pulls down the most recent data exports, it uh, transforms all of the data that's changed since the last run, converts it into the IMS1 roster format, uh, or whatever format uh, the uh, particular piece of data expects, whether it's uh, Caliper for event data or one roster for the supporting data, and then sends that off to the LRW uh, using uh, the, uh, the APIs that are exposed for those different data sources. So this, this mechanism allows us to you know, get all of that supporting data in in a you know, pretty automated way. And so if you couple that with the uh, real-time streaming of events, you have you know, these two mechanisms that are kind of all constantly feeding the LRW, keeping it up to date you know, with very little manual intervention. And, and so that was the goal, and I think that's what we've, we've got to, you know, really be able to scale up that data ingestion without a lot of manual need for exports or things like that. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Lou. Thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, so 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 we took all of that, <laughs> all of that that Gary just described, which is incredibly complicated and uh, and technical, and we're we're currently running it uh, in some form or fashion on on campus. We're not nearly as um, as integrated as we would like, we're not really as automated as we would like. That's that's basically what our goals are for this uh, this fiscal year that that we're that we're in right now. So, so uh, I will say that we are um, uh, we're trying trying to figure out a way to take the dashboard that Gary just described and incorporate it into our UI. We've got we've got. Uh, a product that we call Wolfware, where the NC State is the uh, the fighting wolf pack. Wolfware is sort of a wrapper around Moodle, um, but it lets you get to all your courses, and you can find them easily, and you can use you know Moodle and various other tools that we have. So Wolfware is sort of your entry point, uh, so for faculty and students. So for faculty, we really want to be able to say here, you know, for each of your courses, you can uh, click a button and get to the dashboard for that course and see. Uh, heat map stuff and and and, and whatnot on 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 uh, you know how your students are, are using uh, using things. Um, one of the things that's that's sort of really interesting once you have a learning records warehouse is what can you put in it, right? So uh, I mean, there's obvious stuff, right? So the the bio demo data that comes out of our student management system, sure. Uh, no, no kidding, right? That's that's the starting point. The stuff that comes out of Moodle, absolutely. 
those were those were the low hanging fruit. That's where you start. I mentioned at the top of the talk that, that we use MediaSite uh, for classroom capture. There there are some logs that, that come out of MediaSite. You can tell who's uh, who's looked at looked at the video. You, I think you can tell if they downloaded it. There may be some deeper stuff. Uh, I'm I know that you are able to watch a video uh, that a professor provides you at a faster speed than it was recorded, right? If you're short on time, you can watch an hour lecture in 30 minutes and it, it'll chipmunk through it and they've done some things to adjust the, uh, the, the audio so it doesn't sound like a chipmunk. It sounds like a normal person just talking really fast. It'd be kind of cool if we knew who chipmunk through it and who watched it at normal speed. I don't know if we can get that right now, but it would be kind of cool if we could. It'd be kind of cool if uh, if we could see when someone backs up, right? We could come up with some sort of coefficient. Of, did they just watch it start to finish and be done with it? Did they back up a bunch of times because they're confused about something? So definitely some interesting potential there. And again, since we have the LRW, we might as well. Um, the other thing uh, that I will say is the way all of these predictions work is, well, work best is if they have lots of historical data. You basically use the historical data to train the model. Um, so even if we don't know whether we're going to actually use something for prediction, it's definitely in our best interest to start collecting the data for it if we've got it. Um, if you know, if we start collecting data for for MediaSide or Blackboard Collaborate or other things, or you know, co-curricular things like card swipes at the gym and things like that, if we start collecting that stuff and putting it in our learning records warehouse. You know, maybe in three years or four years, we will be at a place where we could say, "Hey, I wonder if this should be something we're factoring into the predictive model." And if we do, then we'll actually have it, uh, a bunch of historical data to, to, to test and see and to train the model. So, so if, you, if, if you have an LRW and you've got stuff that you can track, it's definitely, I think, in your best interest to track as much stuff as you can. And so we're, 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 we're headed in that direction. Some of the data we own, some of the data we don't own, some of the some of the data we have to figure out maybe how to package it so that it makes sense. Uh, this is an ongoing process. It's going to take time for us to start collecting stuff like this. And then the other thing is, is you know, we want this to be enterprise. We want it to be sort of uh, set it and forget it. We want to run the modeler uh, on a regular basis, especially at the beginning of the semester. We want to be able to share, hopefully, through the integrated dashboard with a faculty member, potentially with academic advisors and those type of people, which students are at risk of not succeeding in a course so that somebody can intervene uh, and help them out. Turns out that if you intervene on at-risk students, it doesn't even matter so much how you intervene. Uh, as long as you do, it, makes an, it, it has an effect. It has a positive effect on that. Uh, so with that being said, just a last minute pitch um, this is an open source project. We work with Unicon and Maris. There are other people who work with Unicon and Maris on different pieces of it. We paid for some of it. The other people have paid for some of it. And we all kicked the can a little bit further down the road. If, if you're interested in this and you want to work with us as well, uh, by all means, pop an email to one of us, to, to Gary, to me, uh, and we'll get you hooked up with uh, and we'll, we'll have a conversation and see if it's something you guys, you know, you want to do with us. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to, I think Linda wants to say a few more things about Unicon perhaps, and then we're opening it up to questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, so actually at this point, we're, we're open for questions. We've got a couple uh, minutes here at the end of this hour. Um, and so feel free to add your questions into the chat. Um, I've actually been getting a couple questions here. Um, uh, people have been pinging me on the side here. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, throw those out. Um, and, uh, but if you have any other questions or comments, 
um, or observations, input, um, feel free to to chat us in the in the public um, window there. Um, so the the first question that I got was um, kind of I guess uh, maybe for Gary um, asking about sort of comparing and contrasting the uh, sort of a data lake versus the learning record warehouse. Um, you know, could you use a data lake as a learning record warehouse? So it's a good question, um, and it's something I, uh, I kid you not, I think about on a daily basis. Um, so the, the main difference between something like a data lake and uh, the, the learning record warehouse uh, is with a data lake, uh, you know, the idea is that you're storing everything and you're storing everything in a raw format. Uh, whereas with the, the learning record warehouse, you're you're storing things in a, a standardized format. You know you have a semi-fixed schema uh, and set of APIs around your data. So if you're thinking about uh, both of them, you know they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, you know you could really think of the uh, learning record warehouse as a data mart, if you're familiar with the term, uh, of your data lake. So all of your raw data would come into the data lake and you'd store that off on some you know, cheap storage mechanism. And then you'd have a process that took that data, you know, something like the data loader that I mentioned, and then put that into the le uh, learning record warehouse for direct consumption by dashboards, reporting, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, and I think as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you if you have data that you know you want to collect, but you don't have time to stand up an LRW and you don't have time to write a data loader, that's certainly a place that you can, you know, offload it at least temporarily, and then you'll, you know, when you're ready, you'll have a bunch of historical data. Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I think the next question. Um, uh, I think is maybe also for for Gary. Um, the question was, what data is stored I get, uh, in Hadoop versus Mongo? Why are both used? Um, and uh, and I guess how does you know Hadoop and you know how what components I guess are used for the predictive model? Got it. Um, yeah, really nothing is stored on Hadoop. So um, or at least that's the intent. Uh, you know, the, the intent is that uh, you would store data in the LRW and then you would pull it out into Hadoop for processing reasons, right? So you'd use your, the compute power of the Hadoop cluster to execute your MapReduce or Spark or whatever you know, process uh, and jobs you had, and then you'd send the results of that back into the LRW. Um, is that 100% clean at this point? No, we're, we're certainly storing some things in Hive uh, on the Hadoop cluster. We, we don't uh, try to store much on HGFS, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, the goal would be for data to flow into the LRW, uh, have it pulled out uh, on some scheduled basis uh, for execution of the model, and have the results pushed back into the LRW and have nothing um, in long-term storage on the Hadoop cluster. All right, sounds good, thanks. Um, and then I think we have one last question, um, probably for Lou, uh, on the faculty response so far. Are there any areas of extreme interest or extreme concern faculty um, are interested in when they see a result that you're describing? Right, so so the short answer is no. Um, faculty aren't extremely anything about this. There there are faculty who are definitely interested in having another tool in their arsenal, as long as it's something that that that, that makes their life easier. They're all about it. I think that that's fine. I don't think most of the faculty that we've talked to have extreme concerns either. I don't think the students have um, either extreme concerns. I think that students that we've talked to are interested in knowing that someone might uh, 
give them a bit of a warning if they if 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 uh, if they need if they need a bit of help. I think that they feel like that's a good thing. I think that most students um, expect that. I mean, in in this age of Amazon and and uh, YouTube, I think that most students expect that we're mining the data anyway, and we're we're looking at stuff. So almost it's almost as if if we don't have some mechanism to warn them they assume that everything's cool because that surely there must be some way to tell them that there's a problem uh, so that's a little bit of, uh, the, the the one place we have been getting a bit of um resistance and kickback is from administrators they you know they they do the all of the extreme what ifs you know are you know are faculty going to be concerned about privacy is it going to be used somehow to to use that predictive analytics to say which faculty aren't doing a good job uh, and so on and so forth. I think there's a lot of uh, maybe unfounded tension at the administrator level uh, about what faculty might get upset about, even though the faculty, as a general rule, don't seem to be particularly upset about any of that stuff. So. Good insight. Thanks, Lou. I think we have one last question and um, and then we, we might be out of time. Um, so I guess the last question is really uh, for Lou again. Um, so what has surprised you the most, um, I guess, as far as things that you've learned since starting the project to what you, I guess, know now? <laughs> wow. Um, so, so I think that this is, this is like a little detail in, in, in the, the predictive model when we look at you know how predictions are made and whatnot but it was so, so i'll say that the way these predictive models work they they give you um correlation but not causation right so there's a, a correlation between uh cumulative gpa and how well you're going to do in the next course but it doesn't explain why right there's it so it, it may be some weird I, i'm sure all of you have seen the the charts uh, on the internet that show like a correlation between Nicolas Cage movies and suicides in Denmark or whatever, that clearly there's a correlation there because the, the, the graphs look identical, uh, but there's, there's, there's no causation. So we don't really know why. We know that there's, there's a correlation. So we, we like to guess. Um, sometimes we guess, sometimes we don't. The, 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 the it, most interesting thing to me was when we when we look at the, the the variable that shows the number of forum posts by a student, right? So the the, the quantity, not the not the not the value, but the quantity of forum posts by a student ha actually has a negative uh, co um, correlation to success. So the more posts, the less likely you are to succeed. It's not a huge difference but it is a negative correlation which which i i found extremely interesting um and and have wrestled with and and again we don't we don't know why but my guess is that if a student is not doing well in a course and maybe knows that they're not doing well and the, the course uses forums they might be you know fishing for help in the forum uh, for the lack of some better way to get help. They might be, you know, posting things. Hey, I don't understand this. Can someone explain it? Hey, I really don't understand this. Can someone help me out? Or, or something along those lines. And, you know, I think the more behind they are, maybe the more they try and get somebody else to help them. Again, that's completely a guess on my part as to the reason. But I, I, I thought that the, the, the fact that that's a negative cor correlation was very, very interesting to me. Yeah, that is super interesting. Um, thanks for sharing that, Lou. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, for coming and spending time. And I hope you've learned a little bit uh, on on the experiences that uh, that we've had here. Um, and uh, and thanks to Gary as well for for presenting. Um, I think if we don't have any other questions, um, then we'll go ahead and close it out. Um, thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.